In fact, you've somewhat preempted my next question because I think one of the really impressive features of your paper um, is, is how you introduce and conceptualize the notion of the real from early on. And um, as a kind of whatever, Lacan teacher, Lacan scholar, I'm, I'm always curious to see how people are thinking the real. And, you know, there's obviously many contexts within, within Lacan's work, how he utilizes the concepts and how Lacanians do. But um, you've started building that bridge for us. And I think for me, it's, it's particularly fascinating thinking about how the concept of the real um, informs and um, uh, Lacanian neuropsychoanalysis. So I'm going to just read out a couple of the 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 accounts or the the like minimal descriptions that you give, which are which I think are are really really very good. And I suppose what I'm also interested in here is how you identify the real as as the nucleus of the unconscious. Hmm. So let me just give you a little. You know, you'll remember them, no doubt. But here we go. Um, this is around the second page of your paper. You say the real refers to a, a negative excess, that which is lacking. For example, absence negativity with respect to the symbolic and imaginary relations. Okay, so, uh, register. So that's that's the kind of first um, step. Uh, so it's um, it's lacking, but it nonetheless makes itself felt as an excess. Okay, really really helpful. Then a few lines down at the core of the subject, the real is the nucleus of the unconscious. As a negative entity, the real is not a mere nullity. It is the presence of a fault without representation. In speech, it is the unsayable, not because it's prohibited, but because it's impossible. It is the constitutive impasse of speech and representation. Uh, as such, the real does not exist in representable reality. It insists, demanding repetition and disrupting the subject's organization in other registers. Tell us more about that and how it has been so important to how you've been thinking about um, neuropsychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and I, I think this is compared to so-called other sort of branches, it's not quite fractured, but those so-called branches of neuropsychoanalysis, you know, Freudian, cohesion, relational. Um, I think this notion of the real is really, haha, really what's um, uh, sort of essential and really unique about the Lacanian contribution. Um, and I, I also think it's sort of important to notice that there are different sort of levels of analysis for looking at the brain. Um, you can look at, you know, the literal traces that from under, you know, good microscope, or you look at the sort of broader neural centers, um, sort of different lobes of the brain, and so to speak. Um, and at the same time, to think that the real, and here I'm, I, I think for my conception of the real, I rely very heavily on Adrian Johnston's work, Slavoj Žižek's work, um, and John Kopchuk's work. Um, uh, where the real, um, and uh, Johnston makes this point in one of his books, that the real, in a sense, refracts within the different registers. So you can have something like the symbolic real, maybe the real as the imminent torsion um, fracturing of the symbolic, an imaginary real, you know, the, the horrid thing in itself that is you know, beyond speech and that it shocks me. Um, uh, in, in a sense of pure anxiety. And also the real real, which uh, Johnston thinks about in terms of the, the um, barred or split corporeality of the brain, the fact that the brain is divided amongst itself. And this is, I think, one of the key senses which I think that the brain has to be thought from a Lacanian neuropsychomatic perspective mm -hmm. is that the brain, and I alluded to this at the beginning, but the brain is, it's a it's a kludge in a certain sense, that it's not a unified organ. It's that there are different systems which are in no sense um, a priori in harmony with each other. You can have different systems with different agendas that want to do different things and do things in different ways. And there isn't any, um, uh, you know, formula. Uh, there isn't any pre-existing, uh, you know, to use the Lacanian term, relation um, uh, between the different areas which resolves it all without any antagonism. Um, you can say something like there is no intracerebral relationship to play off Lacan's, there is no sexual relationship. Um, and so I think that's one really important way of thinking at the, about the brain as, in, in a sense, sort of um, uh, de uh, sort of um, sacralize uh, or sort of uh, sacralizing the brain that it's not you know this majestic you know godlike organ that somehow does everything that you know, that mean, it means to be human. Um, in in a sense, we are in essentially dependent on our brains, but in not not in the sense of perfection. And it's actually the brain has all sorts of short circuits. It has all shorts uh, shorts sorts of um, uh, disjunctures and things like that. Um, and just to give a couple of examples of that, you know. Um, for one of the key um, sort of uh, higher order cognitive processes that 
um, uh, occur in humans and particularly with our massive prefrontal lobes, the prefrontal cortex being the frontmost part of the brain and is one of the most unique features of our brains compared to other mammalian brains that we have very, very big prefrontal lobes. So this, you know, neuroscientists always thought that, okay, what is unique to being human is probably there because that's what we have that, you know, the other animals don't have. So, you know, let's study that. Um, and one of the things that the prefrontal lobes do are these um, so-called cognitive control hierarchies. So that, you know, I know that in this room, in this context, I do X versus when I'm in another room in a different context, I do Y. And you can have more and more abstract rule structures, which allow for different learning capacities, different flexibilities between different contexts, the ability for me to inhibit um, a sort of a habitual action when I know that this is the inappropriate context for that. Um, and to make these very fine grained distinctions in a um, flexible but um, efficient uh, fashion. This is one of the um, key processes in cognitive control. Um, but when you look at the neuroscience of it, the cognitive control hierarchies in prefrontal cortex are in always in an interactive loop. Um, they're called loops with basal ganglia structures. And the basal ganglia is a separate system from the prefrontal cortex, but it's um, a subcortical structure which is preserved um, not only in humans across many different mammalian species, maybe to some extent in all mammalian species. And one of the functions of the basal ganglia in relation to what I'm talking about with cognitive control hierarchies are so-called you know, executive functions I and mean, working memory functions is that um, the basal ganglia operates really indexed to surprise. And it's a very interesting notion where the the um, uh, when you you're in a state, say, of need, you're in a state of homeostatic emergency, and you don't know what to do because you're not born necessarily with an existing pattern for, oh, you know, when I feel this um, affect or this need aroused, I know to do this, and then boom, you know, my need is satisfied. We're, the, we're not quite, we're, we aren't born so lucky. Um, and one of the functions of the basal ganglia is to tag or associate a particular motor trace, or as it's re-represented in um, sort of cognitive terms, a particular, say, rule structure. Um, the prefrontal cortex is, in some sense, an extension of the motor system in an abstract manner. Um, but it, the function of the basal ganglia, one of them, is to tag which action is uh, suitable to meet which need. Um, in terms of to associate, okay, what do I do when this need arises? And one of the processes of this tagging, it's called incentive sensitization. And I'm taking this framework from Ariane Bazan, another leukemia neuropsychoanalysis person who I draw very heavily on. Um, but she emphasizes that in this tagging process, the motor trace is granted an incentive sensitization. This comes from the addictions framework um, research, where the repetition of the trace itself engenders its own different kind of pleasure, a different kind of excitatory pleasure, which is totally separate from the homeostatic need satisfaction. So in a sense, what you have here is that, yes, you get an action which is known to satisfy some need and this tagging function occurs, but the action itself can repeat of its own pleasure. It can repeat of its own excitation even if the homeostatic need state isn't operative or if in some cases it's even not serving homeostasis. You know, the, this is uh, an essential um, thinking in terms of addictions, where addictions are very neurological processes, um, not only neurological, but there is a neurological dimension where you have modifications at the level of basal ganglia processes and um, basal ganglia connections, where this repetition, you know, the repetitive seeking, the so-called wanting of the drug is totally divorced from the pleasurable liking of it, where it's sort of a pure insistence of, of um, repetition, which is, is a very uh, psychoanalytic notion. Um, and so I say this to say that even our most, you know, highly um, advanced cortical processes like executive control are indexed and built upon sort of a fundamental structure which has the risk of being too repetitive, has the risk of being too pleasurable in its own sense and not necessarily serving homeostasis. And this, this kind of, you know, imminent disjuncture, this imminent, you know, antagonism within the brain is one, I think, very important way of thinking the real in the brain, that it's not a whole harmonious organ. It, it's, it's prone to offshoots and short circuits. I mean, that's a, it's a terrific answer because, well, one of the, the bits that I liked so much about what you'd said was, um, in a sense, Neuroscience meets Lacanian theory, well, at least in the sense that the, the notion of the real ends up being quite instructive in, in conceptualizing 
certain of these neurological functions. But I was also quite taken with this. Well, I mean, you know, you, you, you're inspired in part by Lacanian theory, so maybe it's not so surprising, but the description of the insistence and also the description of the repetition almost a kind of repetition compulsion of a type of pleasure, which is not necessarily good for the person. Mm. I mean, you know, it, it sounds like we've got um, almost an emblem of, of death drive in how neurological functioning is functioning. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's an exciting series of um, overlaps and uh, perhaps uh, conjunctions, but maybe another question, um, you also make reference to Ansemet and Magistretti, who are two uh, neuropsychoanalyst scholars who also make reference to Lacan. And um, they have interestingly suggested that neural traces function like signifiers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and they make this argument, as far as I understand it, particularly in terms of the neuroplasticity of such traces. Could you tell us something about that and how maybe you build on that, how maybe you differ from, from their perspective here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just, just to, sorry, very quickly to pick off um, something you just said before that mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's very fruitful when you're reading good neuroscientists who really think through the sort of careful practice of the neuroscientific findings, you'll, you'll find some Lacanian concepts and, you know, um, Antonio Damasio, um, uh, uh, David Linden, um, uh, Joe Ledeau, um, uh, Todd Feinberg, um, uh, these are, you know, different neuroscientists who they're, as, as far as I can tell, they haven't read Lacan, <laughs> but nevertheless, they'll come up with concepts like, um, uh, like, like, like some of the examples I just gave, which um, uh, show that I, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think Lacanian theory is an incredibly useful lens for thinking neuroscience, that for neuroscience, there's always some implicit psychological theory. There's always some whether it's explicit in terms of like cognitive psychology or your own sort of intuitive just folk psychological understanding of your life, you're, there's always going to be some psychological theory for thinking the brain. And I think that Lacanian psychoanalysis is an especially useful theory for doing this thinking, not to totally explain away the brain in Lacanian terms, but to be a space of dialogue really where you can think the brain in Lacanian terms and then find concepts, maybe different relationships among concepts, which would then challenge you to rethink some thinking within the Lacanian field, which is not necessarily reductive to either. Um, so sorry, that was just to, to <laughs> pick up on that on that thread. Um, and I mean, you know, Ansermet and Magistrati really do this kind of work. You know, they take Lacan's idea of the signifier, you know, the signifier as um, you know, the, 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 the differential element, which isn't necessarily, um, it, which isn't related to necessarily a semantic understanding. It's a sort of differential element that attains its meaning only in relation to other elements. Um, you know, words are the common example, but it's not only words. Um, and they apply this really to the notion of the trace. And this is really there, I think, um, an, an, an example of them taking a neuroscientific concept of traces and neuroplasticity and thinking it through quite radically using a Lacanian lens. So the idea is that there are traces, so an inscription, you know, I have some um, uh, event, um, you know, uh, say a, a memory, and it lays down a, a pattern of neural connectivity. The different neurons say, and I'll use my, the hippocampus example again, you know, I have some episodic event, I experience it, it lays down a certain pattern of connectivity within the hippocampal structure and other structures as well, but just to keep it simple for now. And the idea here that, that they emphasize is that the trace is not necessarily uh, faithful to the actual experience. So that you can have an experience, but the way the trace is inscribed isn't a one-to-one -one copy of that experience. It, it, it can slip. There's an, an imperfection in how the brain is recording the traces. Not only that, but at the same time, the trace already exists in a constellation with 10 gazillion other traces. And the brain is constantly in the process of reworking its connections between different processes. You'll have a second event, which is also laid down in the hippocampus, but may contain some partial association to the original trace, but because of this new event, that might change the way that original trace was laid down and sort of might warp it into something different. This is, um, you know, Freudian uh, retroactivity, deferred action, um, uh, it's a very, it's a very Freudian notion. 
Um, but there, there isn't, say, a faithfulness between the trace and the experience. And at the same time, not only for external events, but internal events as well, sort of affective arousal systems, um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, eruption of um, uh, sort of homeostatic needs or the um, uh, shock and sort of uh, emotional inputs that come from within the body and um, uh, in part from the brain brainstem and project into the limbic system. Um, uh, these also have an impact on traces and how traces are processes. So it's, um, I, I think it's one, it's one way for thinking neuroplasticity, again, to not be reductive. You know, I mentioned neuroplasticity as an example where neuroscience isn't reductive. Well, you know, one could then argue that, okay, well, if you understand the brain and you know exactly what happened, then you can reduce the understanding to, okay, I have the traces in the brain and I have the trace or the, I know what the experience was. Therefore, you know, I have a total understanding of it. Well, no, it's not quite the case because there of this potential for slippage and, you know, the, the sliding of the signified under the signal fire. This is the Lacanian concept that's at work here, but um, you can have these um, uh, uh, mismatches which prevent you from uh, reducing the brain either to its total neuroscientific basis or reducing it to say a totally socially determined basis either. And it's not simply a reflective of my entire social history without any type of um, individual, mm, I don't want to say autonomy, um, uh, but an individual sort of uniqueness in how the system of traces is organized based on a constant reworking of experience, which is sort of imminent and unique to each subject, which uh, just to wrap up that point, um, uh, that pre-existing organization of traces itself impacting the way future traces are obtained. Um, so that you, it, it really forces one to think the brain very individually. And so I, from that sense, I very much agree and take from their, um, their version of Lacanian neuroscience analysis and Sermetta Magistretti. Um, that I'd say the difference between their approach and mine is that they, they think primarily in terms of the trace, or at least their English book does. I, I, I haven't read the French material. Um, uh, and I would say that it's important to also differentiate traces at different levels of the brain. For example, um, you know, the, uh, uh, a trace in relation to, see, say, me seeing myself in the mirror, I'm thinking like the mirror stage here, the traces laid down in response in, in that type of event would be very different from the traces that are indexed to, say, you know, um, a traumatic encounter. Um, they're both laying down traces, but the fashion of which, in which they're being laid down, the different types of areas involved would be quite different. So I think that you need to also think, uh, and this comes back you know, to the question of localization, that different areas of the brain do do different things. They may be in dense interconnectivity and interacting with each other, but there is difference. It's not a, you can't just um, uh, homogen, uh, uh, homogenize the brain um, uh, in that sense. So I, yeah. 